Good evening, and you are all extremely welcome to the first ever Dairy Edge Live as part of the Chagas National Dairy Conference. I'm Emma Louise Coffey, presenter of the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Weekly Dairy Podcast. And tonight I am joined by dairy farmer John McNamara and grassland researcher Dr. Mike Egan to discuss the establishment of white clover in grazing swords. As we kick off, we might hear a sentence or two uh, from the panel as way of introduction. Thanks very much, um, Emma Louise, for the invite. Um, I suppose I'm farming in the parish of Nakiani with my um, with my wife and uh, our four children. And I suppose, look, uh, we farm staff there as well. And I suppose, look, we we operate, um, you know, uh, I suppose an efficient, simple system of dairy farming with a strong focus on grassland. Yeah, thanks, Emma Louise. I'm a grassland research officer based in Chagas Moor Park. Uh, the last number of years, my main area of work has been on grassland management practice in spring and autumn. Um, and the incorporation of white clover on commercial dairy farms and white clover cultivars. The session tonight is an interactive session and we welcome any questions or comments you, our audience, may have. So please use your Q&A function um, in order to send your questions in and the panel will endeavour to answer as many of your questions as possible. First though, ahead of the dairy conference, we visited John on his farm in County Limerick to take a look at his farming system. Let's have a look. I'm farming here in the parish of Knockeany uh, in South Limerick. Um, I suppose I'm farming here now with 20 years. When I took over the family farm, Dad would have been milking 60 cows. And um, over the last number of years, then we've built it up gradually. And I suppose that brings us to today, you know, where we're up to 250 cows, you know, as we speak today. Um, I suppose, look, we wouldn't have been able to do that um, was it not for the grass that we've, over the number of years, that we've learned on how to grow it, how to manage it, how to utilize it. Um, so I suppose with that in mind, um, you know, that the pasture base, I suppose, app um, and the whole pasture base um, scene has really helped us in that area, um, where now that we can key in, walk our farm weekly, key in our information, and then I suppose with the knowledge that we can get, um, we can act on that. Um, and I suppose now, as a result of that, you know, all our decisions are proactive rather than reactive. So today we're, um, we're growing 15 tonne of grass year on year. So we're utilizing 90% of that. Um, and I suppose, look, the way we're able to utilize that is because, you know, our infrastructure is really, really good at this stage. You know, we've learned a lot about roadways, multiple gaps, square blocks, you know, um, and especially at this time of the year, you know, the 12th of November today, um, you know, cows have to come out hungry. Um, and I suppose you need back fences as well. I suppose when I would have taken over the, the family farm, it would have been like a Holstein Frisian background, North American maybe sires would have been to the background um, with a nice bit of infertility. So I suppose, look, we've over the years, we've, um, I suppose, wanted to look at that Jersey breed really for two main areas. It was, um, it was just, I suppose, um, a higher solids animal and also, I suppose, an easier managed cow. And maybe eight years ago, we, we started introducing Jersey into the herd. So today we probably have 50-50. Uh, 50% Jersey, 50% Frisian in the herd. Um, and look, it's really working well for us now. Um, we have a lot of good high EBI Frisians um, and the Jerseys have come in on the solid side of it. Last year we did 494 kilos of milk solids per cow. Um, and look, year on year we're up on the 500 kilos of solids at this stage. Um, and I suppose, look, that's probably due to, um, you know, a, a, a compact calving where we're getting close to 90% in the six weeks. A lot of cows calving in February which gives you that 300 day lactation. So, you know, you can maximize the solids from the cows. The labor on this farm is, um, so my wife Olivia is there and our, our four lads, Quiva now is 15 and Pardig is 13, Alva's 11 and, and Connor is just after school. So he's four and a half. And like they all play a role on the farm. I've been lucky enough here over the last number of years to actually have students from the professional diploma in dairy farm management course um, that's run by Togas. Um, and I suppose, look, they've been a huge benefit to the farm as well. I also have um, a neighbouring farmer down the road who comes into me maybe for four or five days a week as well, and maybe a bit more in the springtime. So I suppose, look, it, it's it's the way I look at it with, with the with the students and with the neighbour down the road. Um, there's no day that I don't learn something from them. And, you know, hopefully that they can get something back from this farm as well. So John, the footage has given us a great insight into your farm and I guess to delve straight into it and in, you know, in relation to the topic we're here to talk about today, that is white clover, you're growing and utilising a, a lot of grass and you've quantified that, growing 80, 15 tonnes of grass and utilising 90% of that. Why clover? What is clover going to offer your farm? 
Yeah, sure. Emma Louise, um, I think you're correct there, like in our 15 tonne of grass that we're growing over the last number of years. And I suppose, look, um, you know, I want to keep that, you know, I don't, I don't really want to lose that herbage either, you know, and, you know, we're at that stage now where we've been, you know, doing fairly well over the last number of years, using the pasture base and using that knowledge to, you know, to help us make to the correct farm decisions. Um, like what's Trover going to help me? Um, I suppose there's a couple of areas where I'm hoping, you know, to succeed here. Um, number one, I suppose I'm hoping to have a better quality herbage, you know, with the, with the clover being in the sward, you know, certainly more palatable and stuff for the cows. Um, number two, I suppose, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that I can reduce fertilizers, you know, and I'm hoping I can maybe get that 10 or 15 kilos of milk solids. Um, and maybe just go back to the fertilizers for a minute. Um, you know, I suppose where I'm hoping today or maybe is, you know, mid season to the second half of the year. Um, I think, you know, the, the new technique, uh, the new system brought in by the department, um, you know, that low emission slurry spreading um, has really helped me, I suppose, and will really help farmers. I think, you know, I think it's a good initiative. I think it's an initiative that, you know, will make money for us by actually saving a fertilizer and saving them money. And it's something that, you know, you know, two thirds of my story now goes out in the springtime. You know, all the story goes out using that system. Um, and I suppose, you know, there's certainly, a, you know, a real saving for me here now of 20 to 30 kilos of nitrogen. Um, Certainly, you know, using the story in the springtime, you know, and then using the clover in the second half of the year. And looking then to establishing clover, Mike, um, what are the main methods that you would see that would be used on dairy farms in Ireland? Yeah, so look, well, on grassland farms, if we look at the, the way we establish clover, there's probably two main methodologies of establishing clover. The first one is, and probably the gold standard in terms of establishing a good sward clover content, uh, is a full reseed. So as you would normally do with a normal reseeding practice, you're just including a kilo to a kilo and a half of white clover seed in the, in the seed mixture. Um, best practice, however, for this to, to establish and persist in the sward, we need very good soil fertility and grazing management of that reseeded sward at risk. And in terms of getting the level of clover that we want to kind of get the benefits that John is talking about, that kind of 15 to 20 kilos of milk solids, a saving of up to 20 kilos of, of fertilizer per hectare, we need to be getting a sward somewhere in the region of 20-25% average sward clover content across the year. And to do that, the best way of establishing that kind of percentage of sward is on a full reseed. The second method then uh, that we can do can be successful, um, it can be more challenging, is over sowing. So you're putting white clover seed into an already existing and growing perennial ryegrass sward. Um, this can work, John has done it and he'll talk about it in a while. This can work quite quite well as well, but it, it's more tricky to do it. The, the success rate is much lower because again, you're putting a seed into an already actively growing uh, sward. And in terms of over sowing, there's probably two main methods. Um, the first one is broadcasting with a fertilizer spreader or a um, applicator behind the quad, or the second method is using a machine like a nine buck Guttler and, and John will discuss what he used in his own farm. Uh, again, when you're using this method, earlier on in the year is much, much better because you still have adequate soil moisture in kind of April, the first half of May. Um, you still have a long enough of the grazing season to try and help that clover to establish and persist as, west as, as much as possible before it gets cool in the autumn and into the winter. Uh, so it'll have a much longer season. And again, you're talking about a higher seed in rate or somewhere in the region to two to two and a half kilos of clover seed. But the easiest thing with an over sowing is putting the seed out. Um, before you do that, you need excellent soil fertility. The clover is not going to per establish or persist if the soil fertility is poor. You need very good grass and management in terms of ensuring that you graze that sward uh, correct afterwards. And John can go through some of the practices he has done, but kind of ma mainly what you need to do is treat that like a reseed. You need to keep extremely low covers on it after over sowing for at least three grazing rotations and hitting at 11, kind of 1200 kilos max. Um, grazing it down as tight as possible, four centimeters. You're allowing light down to the base of that sward so the, the grass plant doesn't smother out the clover seed. Um, as you're actually doing it. And then again, in the autumn, when you're closing, those reseeded swords and newly oversown swords in that year, try not and close them early on in the, in the last rotation, close them in the second half. So again, they have a low cover over the winter to help them as much as chance as possible to establish into the following year. And looking then to you, John, year one is 2020. So you have started on this journey at the beginning of this year. Can you talk us through the year what methods you used? So I suppose just for way of context, it's a 70 hectare farm. So, I mean, give us the, the quantity of, of um, hectares that you have receded as well. Yeah, um, Emma Louise, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I suppose, look on the little knowledge that I have after one year at it, um, you know, I think, you know, it's going to take time. I, I don't think Clover, you know, can, 
you know, go 100 percent to a farm, you know, over say a short period of two to three years. I think it's going to take time. It's going to need to develop on farms over time and stuff. And you know, that's that's only kind of my own knowledge. You know, after one year, I suppose. Look, um, it's interesting how Mike just mentioned the, the different methods there because I suppose I actually tried all three. Um, and it wasn't as if I set out to do anything. But look, we recede every year. Okay, we're receding with a large, with a long number of years at this stage. Um, but I suppose we started off in April where we just broadcasted out. Um, just with a fertilizer spreader, um, we just did an acre at a time, Emma Louise, um, a kilo of um, Chieftain Clover um, with a bag of 18612, and just did an acre at a time. And we got a reasonably good response um, from that. Um, that continued into our normal recede that we normally would do maybe, we always kind of recede it now on the farm in the springtime. Um, this year we need to May, I suppose, just to the, the slower spring. Um, and we receded two blocks of ground in May um, with the, I suppose, the normal receding method, just uh, with a disc harrow and a power harrow. Um, and I suppose, look, we went in with uh, the monoculture Nashota. Um, I suppose on the 5th of May, we did, um, uh, we did, I suppose, half the receding ground, maybe uh, three and a half hectares. Um, and we went with two kilos of cool fin with the Nashota. And then two weeks later, we did one kilo of cool fin with Nashota. Um, and I suppose the, the two kilos, the both of them applications and both of them um, methods really worked well. The two kilos of clover seems to be the winner. Um, and I suppose just following that, um, I suppose we'd use the agri seeder from Earth Engineering, um, where we would have also sort of uh, did some more overcast, where we just tilled the soil that Mike had just spoke about there. Um, and we went with one kilo of chieftain there again. Um, now we certainly didn't get as good a take on that portion of ground that we did. And um, we probably did another uh, five hectares there. I mean, we, so we probably were close to 20 hectares in total uh, between the three different methods. Um, but look, on my knowledge to date, um, you know, much better results on the full receipt. So I guess, you know, what, you, what you're saying is echoing, Mike, in terms of the, your receding, your straight receding was the thing that worked best for you. You did that on a roughly 10% of the ground. Is 10% of the ground as much as you can do in a year as a full reseed, or can you push it a bit further? Um, no, I think, Emma Louise, as we go forward, I think, you know, I probably need to reseed more because that seems to be the best way of getting the clover in. Um, reseeding is expensive, clover is expensive. You need to get it right. You know, you, you have to do it right. Um, so I think maybe, hopefully going forward, maybe I can push that to maybe, you know, 15% of the farm for the coming season. Um, and maybe still do it in two blocks. If I can get a block done in, in April, maybe even, you know, at the end of March, even after round one grazing and maybe get the second uh, batch in, you know, the second seven or eight percent in, you know, after maybe the second grazing, um, and that won't put me under too much pressure. And I think, you know, it seems to be the, you know, that gold standard of actually getting the clover in. I mean, look, and that's that's all I've learned maybe after one year. And looking then, um, Mike might have um, taken some of your answers um, and has um, is maybe going to prompt you, John. But I mean, looking at uh, the management, and you know, you, you obviously have clover in your swords. You know, it was. Um, you had the seed in in April, May. So you're in reality managing clover from late June, July onwards. What were the tools that you used in terms of management in order to, I suppose, maximize the establishment of those seeds? Yeah. Um, Louise, look, Mike mentioned there as well that you need to treat it like a reseed. And that's probably exactly what I did. And, you know, and I suppose, look, I, I gathered a bit of knowledge before I started on this journey as well. You mentioned it, a journey to start. And maybe it is a journey. And maybe, you know, maybe it's going to take five, six, seven years. I don't know how long it's going to take. But, look, let it develop and let the progress develop and let's see how it goes. Um, I suppose, you know, um, and if it takes, you know, a bit longer, it takes a bit longer. I suppose... What I tried to do was in the second half of the year, um, you know, I'm hoping as we go forward that the second half of the year is where I'm going to win because that's when the clover actually will really go and come into itself. Um, this year, all I could really do was graze it at them 11 and 12 hundredths, um, just to allow the light down to the base and not let any real heavy covers, you know, come on top of it. Um, I did get caught um, ever so slightly maybe for the last 10 days in August, Emma Louise, where the weather really turned nasty and turned against us. And there was one or two paddocks that just came into the rotation at that time that we just had to skip and come back to them again. And look, I don't think I've, you know, detrimental damage done to them or anything like that. I think we were back on track again in September. Um, but look, I suppose we'll monitor that as we go into 2021 as well. And taking a look into um, other commercial farms that you've been working with, Mike. So ye um, set out to establish Clover using different methods on farms and you've been doing it for a few years. Can you give us some information on the experiment and also the level of success that ye saw and what worked well? Yeah, so kind of four years ago in 2016, we uh, took on nine commercial farms across the country, ranging from quite dry soil types to, to heavy soil types. 
um, and we oversold Clover. So in that study, we, it was only a pilot study, we oversold Clover on 80% of the platform uh, in one year uh, and, and wanted to look at the success rates of that. So if we kind of break it down, um, how we actually worked on that quickly. So there was probably three farms on that that had worked quite well, and those farms are probably averaging uh, of all paddocks that were oversown, including paddocks that, that did not work. Um, they're probably averaging somewhere in the region of 17 to 21 percent um, in, in a in a one year period going from that, and they're still the kind of at that level now uh, last year and this year. Uh, there was probably three farms in the middle then that half the ground did not work at all, and the, some of the ground worked, and they're probably sitting somewhere around 10, 11, 12 percent. Um, and then there are some paddocks then, or some farms then as well that didn't work at all, and those farms I would have less than two to three percent clover on those farms now. And I suppose the, the biggest success of those farms, when one was soil fertility, having the soil fertility correct on the paddocks that went into, you're giving it the best chance possible to actually establish and persist. Uh, second one then was grazing management. Most of these farms had very good grazing management, but you're going to get caught out in some paddocks, as John said, particularly when you do a large percentage of the farm together. Um, so keeping those covers low on those paddocks did help somewhat as well. Um, but it was the biggest factor then on top of soil fertility was kind of sward condition. And what I mean by that was the level of weeds that was in that paddock, the density of the sward, the level of ryegrass that was in that paddock. The higher level of ryegrass and the lower level of weeds, it gave it a better chance because there was more light and more space for that uh, new clover seedling germinating to actually persist and compete for nutrients in that sward. Denser, real dense paddocks and high weed content paddocks did not really work. Um, so yeah, if we look at the nine farms that we did that, that's kind of the way it worked. The way we did that, and we just did a huge percentage of it in a month period, 80% of the farm in a four-week period. Going forward, what we're hoping to do in starting next year was taking on 30 commercial farms across the country. Um, again, in a range of soil types, farming systems, everything else. And what we're doing, we're putting in a program that over three to four years, we are bringing those farms, like John is doing as well, uh, we're bringing those farms from very little levels of clover to zero clover to a place that they will be in somewhere in 20, 22% average sward clover content by the end of year five. And that will be a combination of 10% reseeding per year, uh, over sowing somewhere in the region of 15 to 20% or even 25% per year as well, and identifying those paddocks earlier on that are actually suitable and then correcting other paddocks that have issues. Um, and then keep going on a year on year approach that you can get to that level of 20, 25% that you will be in a position to hopefully then reduce chemical fertilizer over that 20, 30 kilos. And, and to, to, to come in there, a question from Lawrence and Donegal for you, Mike, um, you know, how do you manage weed control in clover swords? Yeah, so look, on, on established clover swords, there's still clover safe sprays there on, on, on established grassland swords that are still clover safe. Um, they're not an issue. However, on new reseed swords as of October of this year, 2020, um, 24DB chemistry was removed from the market. Um, and farmers were allowed to purchase up until October of this year um, and you continue to use it until October of 2021 next year. So after 2021, on new reseeds, new lays, there is no clover safe sprays um, at the moment suitable. So it is going to be extremely challenging. Hopefully there will be new chemistries coming out at the start of 2022 that hopefully will get us, get us through. But if they don't, it is going to be a lot more difficult to establish clover on reseed swords if we don't get that new chemistry. So Lawrence is right. It is going to be extremely difficult if we don't have these new chemistries coming on board to establish clover in new reseeds. And John, one of the things Mike mentioned was grassland management. Um, how important a role does good and intensive grassland management play in you know, making the white clover work? Yeah, I think um, it's key, um, Emma Louise. Um, I'm not sure, you know, could I advise anyone to go at it unless you were actually walking your farm weekly and actually, you know, measuring your farm you know, already, even as we stand at the moment for, you know, for grass management, um, you know, because, you know, clover is, is tricky, you know, as well. I, I think we have to, you know, we need time, you know, you have, we have to learn about clover as well. And, it, it, you know, it's a different, um, it'll probably have a different way of growing than, than what we're used to with the grass and stuff. So I think you have to be, um, you have to measure on your farm, you know, at this stage, you have to walk on your farm weekly, you, you have to put the information into pasture base. And, you know, I think that'll all help you, then, you know, when you take the step, you know, to, to go down the clover route. And, and another step further on, you know, soil fertility is something Mike has mentioned is important. Like, where is your soil fertility at? And is there any, I suppose, key component in terms of pH, P and K that you're chasing on farm, you know, in order to make your soil suitable? No, look, I, I think Mike is right there, um, Emma Louise, and look, and he's coming from the research trials as well. That's, 
Um, look, I suppose I'm using the pH of 6.3 to 6.5, you know, that it has to be at that. Um, and, and, you know, I suppose, look, even apart from clover, I think that's where you're getting your full use of fertilizers anyway, my Louise. And, and I think, look, the, the indexes need to be at three. You know, your P needs to be at three, your K needs to be at three. Look, there's no limit on K. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, in order to get the maximum use of fertilizers, that's where it needs to be, you know, regardless of clover. And I think, you know, that's where you need to be for clover then. And that's, you know, that's where clover gets its best chance to grow. And I think that's, you know, I suppose, that's where we're at at home, um, and that's why we've probably tried it over at this stage. And, and another question then for you, John, um, uh, from Adam, and it's looking at oversowing. Is it a viable option on heavier soils? And I guess, you know, you are farming on a heavier soil type, so a comment from you on that. Yeah, look, I, I probably just need more time, Emma Louise. I, I think the broadcast with the fertilizer spreader in April really worked well. Um, maybe you know, maybe that was because it was done in April, and maybe that's why that has worked better than the stuff we did in June and July, you know? Um, I, I think certainly you, um, I will try it again um, because I won't be able to afford to recede, you know, that 25% in any one season. So I certainly will do a bit more um, over again in 2021, but um, I still will think that the receding is the way to go. And Mike, from a research perspective, um, or indeed your commercial farms, you know, have you experience or knowledge on heavier soils, you know, in, in terms of any guidance for farmers out there? Yeah, so look, on heavier soils, it is going to be more challenging because of, of water logging of soils. In terms of a, of a research capacity, more Park and Clonakilty are quite dry soil types. However, um, Solihead has gone back into Clover now, and, and historically, James Humphreys would have done a huge amount of work on, on heavy soils and maintaining and establishing Clover on those heavy soils quite successfully over a number of years in Solihead and continue to doing it today. Of the nine farms that we originally did, uh, two of those farms would be quite heavy farms in terms of high rainfall and wet farms. Um, it was more difficult to establish it on those farms, um, but it did work on a percentage of the paddocks rather than on a whole farm basis. And those, those kind of farms are in that middle third now that are at that kind of 10, 12%. It is more difficult. In this new program that we're putting in place in terms of 30 farms, we are going looking at some of the heavy soil program. And also Donald Patton and Bally Hayes as of next year, this year and next year is putting clover into Bally Hayes again, which would be a heavy soil farm. So it is going to be more challenging. We haven't a huge amount of work done in terms of research capacity outside of Solihead, but they have a number of years work done. Um, but we are looking at it in more detail now on commercial farms, but also in, again in Solihead and in Bally Hayes. And I guess, you know, it all comes down to management again, and it's what you're talking about. Exactly, yeah. You know, and, and you know, the higher level of management, and it's, it's similar to any sort of a spring and autumn grazing in terms of moving animals off the ground and on off grazing, multiple access points. Um, you know, another thing that comes up time and time again in terms of white clover and, you know, maybe a barrier is bloat. And, you know, I suppose a comment from you, John, in terms of, have you experienced it in the latter half of the year? And maybe then to you, Mike, in terms of information you might have on it too. Um, no, not really, Emma Louise. Um, I suppose, look, uh, you know, I'm not looking for a sward either that has, you know, 30, 40% clover in it. I suppose I'm trying to look for a sward that has that 20% clover and, you know, and, and get that into as many paddocks as I possibly can. Um, I suppose what I tried to do this year was, um, you know, I never left the cows into the clover pastures, um, you know, with any real hunger. Um, and I suppose that stopped the gorging of themselves. And also we tried to let the, we held the her herd until everything was milked and then put the full herd in together. And look, um, so that's kind of what I did, just listen to the knowledge and the research that was out there where I thought there could have been issues. And look, thankfully today, you know, I can't say that we've had any issues with it. So that's how I managed it today. And some follow on practical tips. Yeah, so know. look, in terms of bloat management, it can be an issue. And in, in clonic hilti, particularly in the very early, in the first and second year, it was an issue because of extremely high levels of clover. Over the last number of years in Moorpark and clonic hilti, when we were averaging, as John said, that 20, 25%, and that's kind of the sweet part in terms of getting those benefits in terms of increase in milk solids and potentially be able to reduce that 20, 30 kilos of nitrogen when you're at that 20, 30, 20, 20 25 percent clover. Uh, so it hasn't been an issue on Moorpark or, or Clonic Hilti the last number of years, but there are key things that you can look out for in terms of if you have clover on individual paddocks or across your farm. The first one is excessively high levels of clover. And again, if you're looking at that, anything above kind of 40, 45 percent, it generally happens in July, August time and into early September, uh, can be a high risk period for bloat. Uh, putting cows into a paddock on a and kind of damp, wet morning when dra grass dry matter can be low. And that can also be an issue on, on grass only paddocks as well. And then on very low covers as well, when you have high clover content. So if you can get all one or all three at an individual time, it can be an issue. Preventative is better in terms of if you know you're coming to a paddock that has quite a high level of clover tomorrow, putting bloat oil in the paddock water trough today and, in, and tomorrow. 
and also, as John said, holding the herd up, letting them all out together. But a key management strategy that, that we have put in place here in, and in Clonakilty is putting up a small wire for the first hour and a half to two hours of the initial grazing to remove that big gorging process of the clover. It makes them graze some of the grass paddocks as well. But it hasn't been a huge issue, and it can be, it only is really an issue when you have these excessively high levels of clover content that we haven't seen on commercial farms and haven't seen it in, in the research farms in the last couple of years either. So it's, it's all in the management. Um, another question for you, Mike, uh, coming in from Gareth. Is it possible to sow clover mixed with slurry? So I, I've heard this before, and uh, putting it into the slurry tank and spreading it out. Uh, so the, the key risk with this is, uh, I've never actually tried it, um, but I would imagine the key risk with this is if you're putting it into the slurry tank in the yard with two, two and a half thousand gallons, you're driving down the farm roadway, bumpy roadway, you're not guaranteed that that two or three kilos of slurry is going to come out uniformly across that acre of ground that you're driving on. So it can be much more challenging to put that out, unless there's some sort of adapter that I'm not aware of that you can put in as you're injecting it in. But the variability of that seed coming out uniformly across that 2,000 gallons can be much, much higher. Again, coming back to the basics, using a machine or even a, a doing an acre at a time with a fertilizer spreader is much more successful until we have some more knowledge on that kind of putting out a sorry spreader. And a question then coming in for you, John, uh, from Tom. Will John change his fertilizer program on his clover swords next year? Yeah, I think I think I will, Emma Louise, but not maybe in the first half of the year. You know, I, I look, I mentioned already about the less, you know, that low emission story spreading. That's going to that's going to give me extra nitrogen. I already I know that. That's going to give me extra nitrogen in the springtime next year. Um, so you know, I, I'm going to go with that half bag urea in January. Maybe then, maybe the same in March, and you know, maybe the same towards the first of May. So I'm not going to have any any more out than maybe you know 70 units by the first of April, which would include slurry, and maybe not more any more than 85 units by the first of May, you know, which includes the slurry. Um, so like I'm hoping to cut back my 20 or 30 kilos of nitrogen, but it'll be done, I'd say, from the first of May on, Emma Louise. It's it's really when I'm I'm hoping that the clover will kick in for me. You know, and you know, maybe it'll take a few years for this to happen, but that's what I'm working on. I'm working on maybe a unit a day through the summer months, you know, and if I have to follow up with a bit in August, but I think I'll be doing a paddock by paddock as well. Not every paddock will work 100% with the clover, but I think the paddocks that are working with clover, certainly in the second half of the year, I will be pulling back to nitrogen and them, yes. I think that's a key thing that John said there. So I think we have to treat this on a paddock by paddock basis. And when you have individual paddocks on your farm that are at that level of clover, that we're confident we can get the extra nitrogen in terms of fixation, uh, they are paddocks that we can target to potentially reduce fertilizer for one or two rotations by half in the second half of the year. But again, just a key thing just to get across in terms of putting clover in to be able to reduce chemical fertilizer. If we, John has put it in this year, but he's not in a position this year, even if it works successfully, to reduce the, the nitrogen on those paddocks, because it does take up to 12 months for the clover plant to be in its position to be able to fix nitrogen in it. So it is the second year on those paddocks that have high enough sward clover content, that above 20, 25%, that then we can target on those individual paddocks. And as we continue to get more paddocks on your farm like that, you can target more and more of your farm that have the high levels of clover to kind of reduce that fertilizer in the second half of the year. There are a few questions, Mike, coming in in relation to red clover. I know not specifically on, yeah. on white, but... Um, you know, you may be in a position to answer, what about the role of red clover for silage? You know, is there any research planned or is there any evidence of this working? Yes, look, there was a lot of research done in, in Athen Rye as part of the Organic Farm Programme and even Patrick Kiley in, in Grange a number of years looking at red clover in silage. It can work very, very well. In terms of our programme going forward, we are going looking at including red clover in silage paddocks um, as part of this. I think we have a huge abundance of, of work on white clover that we know it works. We're only starting kind of in more recent years again on red clover, um, but it is something that we can look at. And I think if individual farmers are putting it in, I would do it on a proportion of your, your silage ground um, rather than doing it on a large portion and maybe rotate it within your dedicated silage ground that it can work. And then you can have ind individual paddocks are in, on your dedicated silage ground that you can then uh, reduce your fertilizer for your first and second cut silage. But it definitely will, will work. Um, but as I think we need a little bit more information uh, on these commercial farm aspects to get it uh, kind of in place as well. And an, another question to you, Mike, how do you stop clover from taking over the sward? Yeah, so look, we, we have learned a lot from Moorpack and Clonakilty, and the biggest issue that we have kind of learned with uh, in terms of our grazing management, the first thing, if you have very high levels of clover content, don't close them early in the last rotation because they're going to lose herbage over the winter if they have excessively high levels of clover content. Um, so close them later on. It will allow the grass plant to compete with the, with the clover and kind of recover. 
tight grazing management in the, in the following year then will help the grass, particularly in the spring, will help that grass plant tiller out and fill in some of that empty places that the clover may have dominated. But the biggest thing that we have learned is not to put clover in our dedicated silage wards in terms of putting white clover in these dedicated silage wards. So when I say that, if you're, you're taking, okay, if you take surplus paddocks or you have a, a paddock that you close up at the end of the first rotation just to take a, a bulk cut off it once or twice, um, but in terms of your dedicated silage ground, don't include clover in it because when you cut your first cut silage, you're left with a yellow base, you're depleting the whole plant, the whole sward of nitrogen. The clover plant can have a nitrogen reserve in the stolons and in the roots and can recover much, much faster. And that's when you can get that clover dominant. So avoid heavy cuts of silage on paddocks that have white clover in them. It will help it not to get that uh, over dominance and your closing management practice in the second half of the year as well in terms of your final rotation. I mean, in addition to that, Emma Louise, I think it's probably important that we now match, you know, we match our silage quantities, you know, to what we actually need, you know, so there's no surplus bales being taken, you know, that you only really need to take surplus bales at the very, you know, very little as if you need to take them at all, that you're matching your, you're matching your grass and your clover and your fertilizer to what you actually require, you know, and you're not having these surpluses to be taken. Yeah. And I think that's something that I learned as well over the last 12 months. And it's all about learning, and as you say, it's new for you and it's new for a lot of farmers. And just taking that bit of advice that's available, um, you know, in order to incorporate it into your system. I think as a wrap up, we might get your top tips. But we'll start with you, John, in terms of for anyone who's tuned in tonight and is thinking about establishing white clover in their swords. What have you in terms of advice? Yeah, look, it's, my advice would be still small. I mean, Louise, look, after one year, I, I think, look, you have to be grass measuring. You, you have to be using that knowledge. You have to put it into pasture base. You must be walking your farm weekly. Um, I, because clover, you know, I think then you know your, your farm, you know, you can use the knowledge. And, and, and that's why then clover was a lot more important. And the other thing, just on the fertilizers, um, you know, the pH and the indexes, you know, have to be right. And, and I'd say, you know, that has to be ready and that has to be right even before you start, you know, before you even go down the clover route. And to you, Mike? Yeah, so I think the most important thing that any, anyone watching this tonight can come back and look at it is put a plan in place for the next year and the next number of years to try and bring your farm from zero or very low levels of clover to try and be in a position that you can have an average of 20% clover across your farm. And what I would say is look at your soil fertility report, target paddocks next year that have adequate soil fertility like John has done, uh, target your paddocks that have high perennial ryegrass content, low weedgrass, and target those paddocks, whether it's only 15 or 20% next year that you can oversow. Put a receding program in place, whether it's 5, 10, or 15% per year over the next number of years, and put a clear plan in place over the next three to five years to try and get to that position that you can have adequate clover in your swords. And when you get to that position on an individual paddock basis, treat it on an individual paddock basis. And as you get to that on individual paddocks, they are the paddocks then that you can strategically reduce chemical fertilizer at certain time points, particularly in the second half of the year, to try and get the most out of your clover when you have it. But treating it as a whole farm in a very short period of time is going to be extremely difficult. Um, but putting that plan in place over a number of years will help. And I, I think that's a great note to finish on. And the advice the guys have given us is really the starting point for anyone who is in the same position as John was at the start of 2020. Um, I think if we take a step back and consider all that we have discussed this evening, what was discussed this morning, and if we think about white clover from the research findings that we know about in uh, research settings and also on commercial farms, white clover has an awful lot to offer dairy farmers in terms of increased productivity and probably more importantly, based on the conversation we saw at the dairy conference this morning, in particular, um, Jack Nolan, in terms of you know, reducing the allowance of chemical N that farmers can spread, the nitrogen fixation properties that white clover can offer is huge, and it will be huge as we go forward. My thanks to the panel of John and Mike who joined me here this evening for this discussion, to Declan who's on camera and to the Chagas Dairy Specialist team who have organised this event and I guess in particular to James Dunn, um, specialist who was involved in this particular session. Uh, join us again tomorrow as the Chagas National Dairy Conference goes live again. We will be here at 10 o'clock um, to discuss improving sustainability through improved on farm efficiency. Uh, Dr. Karina Pierce will facilitate um, that discussion with Dr. John Roach, uh, Brian Rush, and Dr. Brendan Horn. And I will be back at the same time of 7 p.m. tomorrow evening, and I will be joined by dairy farmer Dara Killeen and dairy specialist Patrick Going. We will discuss the Chagas Dairy Roadmap, the targets set out, and consider are they achievable at a farm level. Finally, my thanks to you, the audience, for tuning in and for all of the questions that you sent to us. Thank you and good night.